I'm Eric Schatzker and welcome to Bloomberg's Front Row. Today I'm talking to Josh Friedman, the co-founder and co-CEO of Canyon Partners. Josh was a hedge fund pioneer in the early 1990s, and today his firm oversees $27 billion. Distressed debt situations, Lehman Brothers, Caesars, and Puerto Rico have produced some of Canyon's biggest wins. But thanks to trillions in central bank stimulus, there isn't much distress anymore. Josh says it's just a matter of time. You've got big portions of the equity markets that are in business just to make acquisitions. That's what private equity firms business is, making acquisitions and then selling companies. Um, SPACs, they go out of business if they don't make acquisitions. And when people make acquisitions and they use debt to make acquisitions, there will be mistakes. Josh has seen cycles come and cycles go. We discuss how to play the economic recovery, jujitsu tactics in credit markets, the amazing legacy of Michael Milken's Drexel, why Josh is leaving California and moving to Texas. Here's my conversation with Josh Friedman. Josh, here we are in the early days of the other side of the pandemic. How does the world look through the eyes of a credit investor? Well, the world looks dramatically different from the way it looked, obviously, at the bottom uh, back in March of last year, uh, helped by a naturally uh, improving economy. This was not an economy that was headed for recession. It was an economy that was very strong, that got hit by an outside, outside meteor. And now uh, we see the prospect of even more forceful uh, intervention, all of which has driven a lot of capital to be chasing risk-oriented assets, rates to remain extraordinarily low, and then for, therefore people to do the same kinds of very aggressive things that they always do in those types of markets when there's a, a shortage of yield out there. There is so much liquidity and so much undisciplined money bidding up everything in public markets and private markets too. How does a prudent investor compete? For us, uh, we're not an enormous firm. We're around uh, 27 billion in assets. We're not of the same scale of some of the super gigantic asset gathering firms. So it gives us a little bit of a luxury to try to be a little more nimble and try to find value added niches, but still things that are, are large. As I look at the markets today, I think some of the most important characteristics are that there's been a frenzy of acquisition activity driven in part by these low interest rates. So you have private equity uh, in, in a dominant uh, presence in the market. Venture capital, dominant presence in the market. SPACs, which are facilitating public offerings, et cetera. So you're in a, tra in a transaction rich environment, one in which many of the participants, unlike say 30 years earlier, are in business with the sole goal of buying and selling companies. And when they're doing this in a hasty way and they're using aggressive lenders who are dying to give them money, there are always two kinds of opportunities in the market that exist. One is at the point where those acquisitions take place. People need capital. And that's not always an efficient process. It's not always a neat process. And, uh, but it is a process where sometimes there's a lot better risk return than simply buying commodity, high yield product, if you will. The other thing that happens when you get in an aggressive market is people make mistakes. But it takes time for those mistakes to be apparent in the market. So you have to be patient, and you have to wait for those mistakes to happen. And that's what creates all of the stress and distress and other things. Is this a recovery you play like any other recovery? Or is this one different? We saw huge outflows right after COVID. We saw the market seize up. And everything was cheap. Now we're in a market where generally People are comfortable, they feel like the economy's coming back, unemployment is low, so everyone's trying to put money out, but in a world of, of very, very low rates. But what's a little different this time, in my view, and it'll take a while for it to play out, is just the magnitude of the government's programs, both Treasury and, and Fed, uh, in, in stimulating an economy that already is on the uptick. So it's pro-cyclical. Does it appeal to you or does it frighten you? It frightens me. I think the economy has plenty of momentum to improve even without all of the stimulus that's going on. And I think we have, we're really entering the land of the unknown with the extent of stimulus that's going on, both fiscal and monetary. Uh, we've started to see some awfully bright people uh, pulling the alarm uh, hard 
My own concern is not that we necessarily are going to have rates spike to the moon. I think the economy will do some self-correcting. And as long as there's a lot of money chasing, chasing opportunities, that will, that will cause competition for lower rates. And maybe that means we do have lower real rates for, for a time, negative real rates for a time, because of the inflationary issues, which is a, almost part and parcel of this. Um, but I think the longer term thing that I worry about is the hangover from all this stimulus. When you add this much debt to the federal, uh, to the federal debt balance, and when you project out 10 years or 15 years or 20 years, and you figure out what percentage of the federal budget spending is likely to go towards servicing interest, it doesn't leave a lot of room for other activity. And I worry that we're, we're limiting our flexibility in a way that puts a bit of a damper on the economy in the medium and the long run. Credit, as at least I understood it, was always about the fundamentals, right? Analyzing the prospects for payback and then making a judgment if the price implied a good or perhaps just a good enough return. Not unlike value investing, you might say. Do fundamentals matter any longer, at least right now, in this era of limitless monetary stimulus? It's interesting, that applies in equities, in debt, in a variety of different asset classes. Um, you know, you used to see leverage buyouts where a lot of the value was created by manipulating the balance sheet. And then you see more activity on the left side of the balance sheet, value creation, create credits with integrity and equities with integrity. And now you see one of the most rewarded strategies is super quick response, limited due diligence, no management interference whatsoever, pile into uh, tech investments. Mm -hmm. And it's been very well rewarded in this kind of a market. And you can say, well, maybe due diligence doesn't marry. Maybe understanding the management, having a relationship with them, and having the levers to pull, maybe those don't matter anymore. I think all those things still matter. And I, and I think they will. And we go through these types of periods in the market. Credit, I think it absolutely matters that you underwrite situations where you're likely to get paid back. Or alternatively, you're involved in distress situations where you're likely to get securities that are worth a whole lot more than their entry price that you've paid for them. And, and I think those opportunities are still out there. They're just harder to find. They were very easy to find nine months ago. They're much harder to find today. And we'll go through those types of ebbs and flows. The, the, the problem is the kind of mentality where people say, I just have to put money to work. I have to, I have to get some yield on my money somewhere. Um, produces mistakes. Sure, but can't you just play the greater fool theory? Even if it's expensive, buy now, knowing that somebody is going to want to pay more for it and trade out of it later? No, I think that's a very bad way to be doing credit <laughs> investing. I, I think there are fundamentals with respect to credit that don't necessarily exist in the same fashion with equities. But, but remember, equities and debt are all part of a continuum of pricing, and they're very much related to each other. If you hold rates artificially low long enough, people will be forced out on the risk curve. It's exactly what, what uh, the people in the government would like us to be doing. They're deliberately trying to make us feel comfortable with credit. When you worked for Michael Milken at Drexel, uh, it took a certain skill set to succeed in credit. What's the skill set required today, and how does it compare? What we try to do, and um, we're, maybe we're not completely unique in this, but we try to find situations that are of great complexity that just aren't so accessible by everyone out there. That in and of itself is a little bit of a competitive barrier insofar as there are any barriers at all in our industry. So we try to buy things that are highly complex. Maybe it's just at the point of an acquisition and a sponsor needs something special. And you can get something from that relationship and get essentially paid for your money, but not just for risk, but for solving a problem. Or you're involved in a stress situation or a distress situation where you can do a very high value added amount of work, understanding your rights relative to others' rights, and then also create maybe some value through the negotiation process. And also understanding the business itself in great detail. So I think that um, even back then, uh, those, those basic factors were, were critical. Given that speed seems to be the cardinal advantage to those willing to make equity investments. Is it similarly the cardinal advantage, the key skill you need as a credit investor to be able to analyze quickly and be nimble in your capacity to commit debt capital? 
Not always, interestingly. If you take a look at some of the larger bankruptcies that have taken place historically, like, say, Puerto Rico or PG&E, or if you go before that to Lehman Brothers, you could have been very, very late and still made an awful lot of money for an awfully long time. Or Caesars, a more recent one, where we were the largest creditor, but we didn't buy everything all at once. And, and there's a changing dynamic that goes on with these processes, and if there are multiple opportunities to enter and different debt securities at different levels and different collateral and so forth, that gives you places to enter. But I don't think, um, I don't think it always requires as much speed as, as, as you might think. There is a part of the market that does require speed. Um, private equity companies are competing to buy things. SPACs are competing with each other to buy things. And in those situations, certainty of closure and speed is critical. Some of those won't be such great acquisitions. Some will be terrific acquisitions. But part of the game, because it's so competitive, is that speed becomes a big factor. Stressed and distressed debt has become um, an arena for open warfare among creditors. There are all manner of jujitsu-like maneuvers, right, to shift collateral, to gain documents, to create new tiers of seniority. Um, is that simply the new reality? And Canyon has to use whatever tactics are necessary to be competitive in that arena? Or are there lines that you won't cross? Well, there are lines we won't cross. Um, you have to be smart. You have to be sophisticated. You have to protect yourself, particularly if you're already involved in a situation. You have to be careful not just about the debtor who's opposite the table from you, but you have to be careful about the other creditors who are sitting next to you, who you think are similarly positioned, but in this day and age are being much, much more aggressive about doing things that might benefit themselves, even though they own the same security that you own. Uh, and to, to your detriment. So you require that level of, of, of sophistication. But we're not a do anything to anybody uh, shop. I think that um, when I grew up in the business, I remember that people used to quote Gus Levy at Goldman Sachs, which is where I started my career, as saying you have to be long-term greedy, not short-term greedy. I think that some of the short-termism uh, really comes back to bite people. We have to be trusted in the marketplace. We have to be trusted by issuers. We have to be trusted by sponsors. We have to be trusted by management teams. And we have to be trusted by other creditors. That doesn't mean we're going to be unsophisticated. It doesn't mean we're not going to protect ourselves. But, but uh, and, and different firms draw the line in different places. But we have to be trusted. So we have to behave in a certain way and take a slightly longer term uh, point of view than, than maybe everyone else takes. I love the idea of behaving, conducting oneself in such a way that you earn the trust of your counterparties, you earn the trust of issuers, you earn the trust of the market. But there are people who are behaving in a fashion that doesn't earn any trust. If anything, it violates the trust, and they aren't being punished for it. I mean, those might not be the first people that one invites into a deal. If you're involved in something proprietary that has great risk return, you call people you trust and you get called by people you trust. So I think, I think the market has a way of working these things out. I think regulators have a way of working these things out. I think courts have a way of working things out. It, 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 I think it's just part of the give and take. You have to be much, much more aware of this, though, and much more sophisticated and much more cynical today than perhaps you had to be um, a decade ago. What are some of the things you won't do? We try not to do things where you're, where you're um, similarly situated with everybody and you cut some private deal and then keep it secret and you elevate it. We'd rather- Up tiering. Yeah, I mean, it's one thing if there's a group forming and something's happened and you have to make sure you're part of that group and, and so forth, but, but you, you, it's, it's, it's not really the way the game's supposed to be played. Canyon has made its biggest profits on distressed situations. Lehman Brothers, Caesars, Puerto Rico, and it's impossible not to have noticed the lack of distressed debt during the pandemic. Um, people have asked, and I'll ask you the same question. Is the age of distress over? No, distress will come back. It always does. Because this type of environment is exactly what creates mistakes. Uh, you're seeing acquisition. As I said, you've got big portions of the equity markets 
that are in business just to make acquisitions. That's what private equity firms business is, making acquisitions and then selling companies. Um, SPACs, they go out of business if they don't make acquisitions. And when people make acquisitions and they use debt to make acquisitions, there will be mistakes. The other thing I should say is that um, there are industries going through tremendous disruptive change right now where there is distress right now. Mm -hmm. uh, it, I think finding the most interesting opportunities is difficult, but look in the real estate business. You know, CBL is a secondary mall operator that's a fairly recent and significant additional position we have because of the disintermediation, disintermediation excuse me, of, of retailing because of the internet. B malls are in trouble. But that doesn't mean that all the real estate is bad. Some of it's quite well located and has alternative uses. If you look at retail, you look at um, multifamily is a, is, a, is a protected class that's doing well. Industrial is doing well. But if you look at office, we're sitting in a, in a building today that's probably 20% occupied at the moment in terms of people actually showing up to the office. We'll see how many people show up a year from now. A lot of people have gotten used to working, at least in part, from home. And so it's caused companies to rethink their space needs. And even a 5% adjustment can cause real, real issues. Hospitality is another area. We're clearly going to see permanent closure of a lot of hotels. And that will have effects on that business. It's fair to say, Josh, that uh, Canyon had something of an awful start to the pandemic. Um, and then it roared back. What happened? Well, two things. Um, we made some mistakes. Certainly, uh, there was one sub-asset class in particular in the distressed oil rig area that the displacement of supply versus demand when demand vaporized really caused a lot of companies to restructure that might have made it through in a more normal trajectory, even, even in a difficult uh, trajectory. But uh, a couple of things happened. One is um, we just held on to the vast majority of the things that we had in our portfolio that got priced down and they got priced back up. As I said, at the end of the day, if you get paid off, you get paid off. Um, so somebody might choose to market to market at a low price. You can't necessarily buy it there, or, nor can you necessarily sell it. This is the challenge of liquidity in, in markets that get so disrupted. But that causes write downs, and that's, uh, that's painful. Um, but those have virtually every single one of those has roared back and then some. Um, a lot of transactions that were potentially looked like they might go off track, came back on track, and then did really well. We talked about the distressed situation in Caesars, the post-bankrupt equity, which we got for our, for our debt in Caesars, um, plummeted, of course. Went, the, the Caesars went overnight from being 99% occupied with record backlogs of conventions to being closed. And then they were supposed to merge with El Dorado, of course, came back. The merger eventually happened, and the stock is over 100 today. Um, after being in the single digits. After being in the single digits. We're out of that transaction now, I should say. But, but the point is that um, with debt securities, you could simply hold them. And if you got the credit right, you were fine. It was just mark to market. With equity securities or post-bankrupt equity securities or whatever, it's a little different game. The other thing that happened is there were a lot of interesting opportunities to fill any, any, any available liquidity in the portfolio could be deployed in a lot of things that were pretty clear and pretty straightforward. First, there were IG bonds that had been downgraded, mm -hmm. or, or at least had traded down, not necessarily downgraded, pardon me, um, with everything from Ford to Boeing to uh, others. Um, then there, there were high yield bonds that um, almost anything was offered at a, at a, at a, at a number with the price offered a great, great risk return. And then there were existing distress positions that just sort of flopped around and it was a chance to incrementalize those positions. So really, there, there was a, a, it was a quick window because the Fed came in so forcefully and the markets responded so quickly. But there was an opportunity in, almost in waves uh, to take advantage of that. There's a raging debate over monetary and fiscal policy right now, the risks of inflation, the direction of rates, the strength of the dollar. Do you need a macro thesis to play successfully in credit to be able to anticipate when the day of reckoning is coming for those mistakes that are being made now? I think you need to at least be highly aware of what the risks are and then protect against a multiplicity of outcomes as opposed to necessarily have strong conviction that one particular outcome is going to take place. It, it's very clear, and it has been very clear, 
that there is inflation in the economy today and that it's going to continue for a while. Demand recovers quickly, but supply chains don't recover immediately. So you see disequilibria all over the place and you see that reflected in pricing. When you have such strong uh, Fed uh, Treasury policies uh, to supplement people's incomes while they're sitting on the sidelines, um, they don't have an incentive to enter the workforce right away. But I think we have to be cautious and protective of what we're doing um, for our clients. So generally, our portfolio has a relatively short duration and very outsized yields for that duration, but, but also more cash because it's harder to find those situations. Um, so that's, that's our way of being defensive um, in this type of an environment. Tell me a bit about the origins of your firm, um, how you and Mitch Julis became partners, and why you decided to start a hedge fund 31 years ago. So Mitch and I were at Drexel together. I had started at Goldman Sachs uh, doing investment banking. He had started at Wachtell Lipton. He ended up uh, being uh, uh, doing distressed credit analysis at, at Drexel, which was, uh, which was really an exciting area. I ended up um, joining him out there on the other side of the floor doing capital markets, which was originating all, originating all the debt for leverage buyouts and so forth for the financial sponsors. And at the time, there was, uh, if you did one deal every three months, that was a lot. And then by the time I left, it was sort of a deal a day. It was, it was incredibly exciting, incredibly, uh, incredibly creative. But uh, we were already struggling at the end of that time period at Drexel trying to figure out, okay, what, what do we want to do next? I had always wanted to be an entrepreneur and have my own business. Um, the reason I left Goldman Sachs is because when my when I was very young, my dad said, you have to have your own business. And I figured if I'm going to learn how to have my own business and I don't have any money, well, Drexel's a good place to learn and it's more exciting and entrepreneurial. I really didn't want to stay on the street forever. I wanted to be on the buy side. And so, um, so when Drexel uh, vanished, we, Mitch and I immediately said, here's our chance. We kind of had two choices. It was mutual fund or hedge fund if you wanted to buy non-investment grade debt. And at the time, um, we we're looking at the pricing of everything, and it was really low. It was, things were cheap, really, really cheap, because Drexel had been the biggest market maker, and they were gone. And meanwhile, the government was selling any holdings they had through, they, they had foreclosed on all these, uh, the RTC had foreclosed on all these savings and loans, many of whom owned high-yield bonds. Those were being sold wholesale into the market at low prices. So we're thinking, how do we take advantage of this? These are some terrific credits at cheap prices. And um, we met with various people, and we decided that given the liquidity profile, particularly of the securities, which can be very liquid at some times and less liquid at others, mutual fund type model didn't match. Plus, mutual fund was straight fee. Hedge funds were you know, fee plus carry. It just seemed like a better fit with the kind of complex investing that we were trying to do, particularly for the distressed side of the world. So that's how we started it. And we started it with, uh, I think we had $17 million in the first close and then it slowly climbed its way up. Needless to say, uh, many of your Drexel colleagues also went on to do great things in finance. Um, what is it about that short time working for Mike Milken that informed your thinking and so dramatically changed all your lives? Well, one of the things that I think Mike was best at was really unlocking creativity and teaching you really to listen to clients, to what they needed, to what they wanted, listening to people on not just the, the, the issuer side, the companies that needed capital, but also listening carefully to the market and having active interactive discussions and being creative in a, in a completely unbounded way. Um, so every week, every month, there was a new kind of security we were invest, in, inventing. I mean, CLOs were, were, were born there. Um, it was, uh, I remember Mike inventing increasing rate notes because the banks had dropped out of a deal we were doing and we said, oh my God, well, they need a bank. Where are we going to get a bank? And we said, oh, well, let's just issue some notes where the rate keeps going up every, every quarter forever until they take it out. And once the deal's done, the banks will come in because banks wouldn't finance hostile deals so readily then. It was a hostile deal. So it was a very creative time. And so it's not surprising to me when you had really smart, really creative people who were being taught, hey, there's no limits to your creativity, and you've got new financial instruments that we sort of knew more about at Drexel than others at other firms knew about, um, it's not surprising that a lot of people created 
really amazing firms in the aftermath of, 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 of that first stage of our careers. Several of your peers, I'm thinking of uh, both the individuals and the firms at um, Apollo, Oak Tree, at Ares, for example, went on to construct giant businesses, giant businesses, asset gathering machines with hundreds of billions of dollars spread across the spectrum of credit and into private equity and into real estate and other things too. Why didn't Canyon follow a similar path? I remember with our hedge fund having an early discussion with Mitch, and I think it was when Oak Tree had first started, and they immediately had a ton of assets. And I said, I said, Mitch, there's, there's a pie chart that asset allocators have. And they say, here's how much we want in high yield. Here's how much we want in distressed. We want this much in converts. We want this much in you know, long short equity, this much more in global macro. And then there's a little tiny slice that's so thin, you can't even tell that it's a slice. And that says all other. Then you look at our business model for our hedge fund. We do this, we do some of this. We try, we try to add value in all these things, but there was no there was no slice on the pie chart for what we did. We were the all other. And that's how we started our business. And, and it certainly had a, a sustainable path where we're, we're still around a lot longer than many others who started in that path. And we have added other, other business lines to, our, uh, to our, um, our array of products, and I'm sure we'll continue to do that. But, and, that can, and that can change. But those firms have done a great job at being much more uh, you know, uh, aggressive uh, assets, uh, gatherers of assets in particular, in particular silos, if you will. Is there an optimal size for a credit manager? When we say credit manager, there's so many different types of credit managers. So our CLO business, for example, we try to grow it at a pace where we can continue to stay in a certain performance bracket. And if you grow it too quickly, you end up looking like the market generally for bank debt because you have to buy everything to fill all those vehicles if you grow it too quickly. If you grow it deliberately, you can get to that same size. It might take a little longer, but you maintain a certain position in the market. Um, structured products is another area. Structured products, I believe we have um, infinite growth capacity compared to our current size in it. We've been much larger in the past when there was a distressed market. Now we've retooled that expertise in-house and we've, we, we, we use that in, in, in more of a mutual fund format. But the market is enormous and we're a speck in the ocean there. And I think we can continue to be a very high value added player in that product at a much, much, much bigger size than we are today. In other products, um, I'd say it's, you have to be more limited if you're gonna really add a lot of value because the product, there's too much competition. What about the hedge fund? Your, call it Evergreen Hedge Fund, has survived when so many others, King Street, Anchorage, GSO, Centerbridge, have either shrunken or effectively dissolved. How come? Part of it is that we, we do try to keep the size in a range where we can add value. We make mistakes. When we make mistakes, we want to make sure our clients know it first, not last, we explain exactly how we plan to get out of those mistakes, and then we try to actually do that in a way that's understood, and we try to stick in areas where we have unique high value added. Um, it is a hard model. You have to have good returns because the fee structure is generally higher than it is in certain other types of uh, formats. But, uh, but I think that that's, um, I think as long as you keep the size in a certain range and don't grow it infinitely, you can continue to scale and be you know, markets have scaled too. So in today's market, that range would be what? Well, right now we, we tend to try to keep the, the hedge fund plus the managed accounts that are managed like that in the vicinity of call it uh, 10 to 15 or $17 billion in that range. That includes some distressed drawdown vehicles as well. And that seems to be a pretty comfortable zone for us. We, we, we're not, um, you can look at your investedness as sort of an index of how easy it is to put money to work. Right now our investedness is we're consciously lower than it has been historically, partly because we're being more cautious about the market tone generally. It seems like it's a little, everything's a little tight. Have you ever considered going public or selling to a larger entity as uh, Oak Tree did to Brookfield? What I worry about um, when you sell an interest in a firm is all of a sudden there is pressure to simply raise assets. If you listen to the conference calls of the firms that have actually gone public and you listen to the questions that are asked, they're generally about AUM. Um, so, NFRE, yes. Yes, correct. So we don't necessarily want to be subject to those, those, same, those types of obligations or pressures. Um, 
I also don't necessarily want to dilute the culture. Does the prospect of liquidity appeal to you? So, I mean, we're not suffering for lack of liquidity. We've had good careers, so we're all, we're all fine, um, but we're not, we're not rushing to the exit looking for a big liquidity event right now. You and uh, Mitch Julis are still the co-CEOs and the co-chairman of the firm after 31 years. Uh, as you may know, Josh, succession planning is all the rage on Wall Street right now. What's your succession plan? It's always harder in a smaller firm to do that, especially when Mitch and I have been such a big part of the culture at Canyon. Um, that being said, you know, we're now, we now have 15 partners, not two. We all feed out of the same bottom line. Um, and, and we're trying very hard to have a system where there is a possibility for a very successful succession. So what you found, and that's, that's a process, that's not a one-step thing. Um, and so if you look at the firm today, we've elevated into very senior positions in the firm a number of our next tier of partners. And, and I think that will continue. That'll be an evolutionary process. And my hope is that at the point when we decide that we're not going to be here every day, and hopefully that won't be when we're you know, hanging on for dear life at the end of our lives, but hopefully well before that, um, we'll, it will be pretty seamless. You and Mitch are moving to Texas, and you're taking a sizable part of the firm along with you. How come? I think, um, I think back to the excitement that we had when we came to California, and a change of scenery sometimes is a great way to enter, enter, energize an organization. And Texas is clearly a very, very business-friendly state. Um, California is a difficult state to run a business in, and particularly a business like ours. Um, between the tax rates, the time of a commute, um, the cost of housing, um, the cost of schooling, um, cost of living generally. If you look at our next tier at our firm, uh, there's no question that for them, uh, it's not necessarily the optimal environment. And it's a different environment from a business point of view than it was when we started here in, 19, well, in the mid-1980s. And I think what you're seeing is um, uh, almost an acceleration in the number of people who have decided that they'd like to be in that, in that in that, tech, in that Texas office. Dallas has a lot going for it. There's no question about that. But I don't personally know that many people who would trade the climate, the culture, the food, the lifestyle in Los Angeles for Dallas. Not to mention all you've built here, right? You've got your family life, your social life, you've got your community life, your contributions to the LA County Museum of Art, for example, the Getty Trust, the Broad Foundation. Caltech, some people who are evaluating similar situations have trouble understanding the trade-off. Was it a tough decision? It is a tough decision. It was a tough decision. Um, but I've, it's first of all, it's not just about, about me or just about Mitch. And second of all, I think that, um, I, I think that you have to look at the trajectory of, of Dallas and Austin and other cities in Texas that are enjoying the same kind of trajectory that California had in Los Angeles, particularly when we came to California uh, in the 80s. So I think there'll be plenty of opportunities to continue to engage with institutions in, in our new home. I think that'll be exciting and I think it'll be energizing to people. And uh, we think it's really important to be involved in the community where you live. Canyon will still have a presence in Los Angeles and will still have a significant office here. Um, we haven't forced anyone to move. Uh, but as, you, as you've mentioned, a number of the senior partners are moving, but also an awful lot of other people. And I suspect that over time, even more will, uh, because it's an, attractive, it's an attractive lifestyle. From the standpoint of a business owner, an entrepreneur in finance, is the California model a broken model? I don't know if it's, an, if it's a broken model, um, but, I, but I do think it's a challenged model. Um, you're seeing it in Northern California as well, where people are beginning to migrate to Austin, particularly. Um, New York, you're seeing a lot of people move to Miami. So I think um, states do have to think about how their public policies affect those who work in them. And these are pretty mobile businesses, as we found out from, uh, from functioning during the post-COVID crisis. One of the rewards of uh, building a business like Canyons is that it has made you a wealthy man. Could you tell me a bit about what you're doing in the family office you're building? Philanthropically, I've really tried to focus on the sciences and education, uh, focus on the arts and humanities, because I think that 
the arts and humanities are a, a, a key component of any great culture, in any great city, in any great country, and it's an area where people of different backgrounds and wealth and races can have a discussion about issues in a, in a pretty open way. So I think supporting things like LACMA or the Andrew Mellon Foundation where I'm involved or others, um, I think are really important, or Lincoln Center. These are, the, I, I think it's, it's really important to give back to the community and to a broad group of people in the community. And I think these are institutions that do that. One of the things people who achieve success in business struggle with, particularly if the success comes quickly, is what else to do with their lives, what kinds of contributions they should make, if they should be philanthropists, what either needs or pet projects they should devote themselves to. What advice would you give? I think you have to start early. I think you don't want to just run just your career and then you stop and all of a sudden you're finding things. You know, for us at the firm generally, we have always tried to, uh, to impress on our colleagues the importance of being involved in something other than their work and in a material way. And we try to do that by example through things that we do through Mitch, I know, is extremely active in the not-for-profit world, and, and I have been as well. And some people say, oh, that's distracting. It's, you know, it's not distracting at all. I think you, you, people have capacity to do plenty, and I think it's the right thing to do. And with that, we'll conclude our conversation. Thank you, Josh. Thank you.